Hello and welcome to Open Source Governance. I'm your host Pendar and you're listening to the fourth episode of this podcast. As promised, in this episode, we're going to talk about Dutch politics. And for that, I have invited Quincy Gario as a guest to tell us all about Dutch politics and ins and outs of the system. I met Quincy for the first time in 2017 in an exhibition I initiated in Amsterdam in W139, where Quincy was invited as a guest in one of our programs. And since then, we have crossed paths in different occasions in the art scene. Quincy Gario is a performance poet and artist from Crusawa and St. Martin, two islands in the Caribbean that share continued occupation and colonization by the Netherlands. His work centers on decolonial remembering and unsettling institutional and interpersonal normalization of colonial practices. Gario's most well-known work is Zwarte Piet is Racism between 2011 and 2012. As a member of the collective Family Connection, established in 2005, by Glena Martinus and Gala Martinus, respectively his mother and aunt, his current research is about attempting to institute otherwise. Quincy is a Utrecht University Media Studies, Gender Studies and Postcolonial Studies alumnus and a graduate of the Master Artistic Research Program of the Royal Academy of the Art in The Hague. He is a 2017 Humanity in Action Detroit Fellow, 2017 and 2018 Buck Fellow, 2019-2012 APAS participant, and a 2020-2021 Sandberg Institute Critical Studies Fellow. Gario received, among others, the Royal Academy Master Thesis Prize 2017, the Black Excellence Awards 2016, the Amsterdam Fringe Festival Silver Award 2015, the Kervin Award 2014, and the Hollandse Nieuwe 12 Theater Makers Prize in 2011. His work has been shown in, among other places, Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, Macba in Barcelona, Latvian National Museum of Art in Riga, Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, MHKA in Antwerp, Tent in Rotterdam, and Gothenburg's Kunsthal in Gothenburg. Gario also ran for Dutch Parliament as a candidate for the political party Bayein in 2021 national elections. First of all, thanks a lot for, for accepting this invitation. I, I'm so happy to have you on board. It's, uh, you, you know, the podcast has just like three episodes so far and um, I'm starting to like kind of go into like this research um, process for myself, but mm-hmm. as well as somebody who's listening and has no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, because like I'm doing this project since 2015 and I never had the chance to really sit down and, and research, mm-hmm. uh, also because life, you know, you, I didn't have, I had to earn <laughs> money so I couldn't really focus and I'm super like jumping from uh, one thing or another. So actually this pandemic gave me a chance to, okay podcast one month one episode let's keep it constant <laughs> and it's really uh, helping a lot uh, thanks for inviting me yeah i mean when you when you sent the email i was like okay this is great i mean we need to have more of these type of conversations mm. about politics in the netherlands um also in a way that is accessible i think a lot of the conversations about politics in the netherlands either assumes that you had um lessons in high school uh, about what the Dutch system is, or Mm. it assumes that you know all the intricacies um, of like the gossip and um, who's working with who and partnering with who. Mm. And so it's really either in depth or really, really shallow. And I think what you're doing right now is 
is trying to find that middle ground of like, hey, let's make it accessible for even the ones that don't have the time to follow every single news bit about what's going on in yeah. our city, city halls, uh, city councils, parliament, senate, uh, kingdom councils, provincial states, um, the waterschappers, the, the, the regulators of, of, um, of the waterways and all that kind mm. of stuff. Which is a separate government, I heard, by its own, right? Exactly. Yeah. If they we're, stop working, we're all doomed. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're all doomed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. The, um, like you say, this is kind of um, um, some sort of uh, middle ground in between different disciplines also, because... I'm an artist. I don't have so. Uh, I when I started this, I did not have so much political science knowledge or programming knowledge, for example, because part of it is is the project is is the idea is to base everything on open source programming and blockchains to secure the data and all of the stuff. But um, so this this was kind of uh gave me uh, or the community who's following the project uh an opportunity to really like have uh perspectives from different views and from different people from different backgrounds which was kind of nice um to to listen to and but the thing that for example in 2017 there was a lot of uh uh, sessions like public sessions and uh, there was people coming from all sort of backgrounds but the important thing was that they also felt the need for some sort of rethinking of the system so uh, if you want to have a very general explanation about what the open source governance is going to do is about rethinking the order of doing things uh, or are we doing things the right way is it mm. efficient enough is it including including all voices you know so that's why i think um you and your all of your work that you've done as an artist as an activist and uh, your participation in buy-in is is i think is very important uh, and, and it's a great example. Um, um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm just, I think my, my participation by my aim is just me being lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the lost artist who's like, okay, wait, I found myself in a situation now. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can discuss this as much as you want uh, or as little <laughs> as you want. <laughs> When we get there. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, this, uh, the, I thought for the, our conversation is, uh, we, we kind of go through a very general explanation of what Dutch politics is, as if imagining somebody who has no idea listening to this. Also, yeah. a lot of the listeners are international. So exactly. maybe they have no idea what the parliament, you know, they know now that what the parliamentary system is, because <laughs> I explained they should be if you didn't go back and listen. Uh, uh, but like the king and what he's doing and what is the first cam a way the camera, here's the camera and stuff like that. And then we can uh, go when we have that kind of out of the way, we can maybe talk a little bit about uh, the history of the Netherlands and the colonial past and mm -hmm. the reason for uh, more uh, radical actions and for like, you know, uh, in uh, initiation of uh, other ways of uh, kind of uh, uh, including in different, all communities within decision-making mm. processes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then my first question from you would be, what is Dutch politics? Like, how does it work? Uh, 
Um, I think what we can say about Dutch politics is that we've we've been taken over by a managerial class. So currently we have a parliament that's being led by a politician, um, center-right politician, or at least um, the party that he's from presents itself as center-right, but actually extreme-right, if you look at the policies that they're, mm -hmm. that they're voicing and trying to enact, is um, a leader that presents himself as having no ideology. Okay. And I think one of the one of the interesting things about that is the moment when somebody says that they have no ideology, that means that it's already all around us. And I think when looking at the way in which Dutch politics has has set itself up and functions, is that it's uh, technocratic, it's neoliberal, um, it's about small government, mm -hmm. um, and it is in a way not really friendly towards dissent, uh, minority voices, hmm. um, and it minoritizes and, and magnifies violence um, towards groups that don't have the numbers to enact um, changes in votes. Hmm. And so when you, when you put all these different things together, then you realize that we're actually in a pretty hostile situation that presents itself as progressive and tolerant. Um, the Netherlands had a hand in um, the, the institutional violence of the European Union against Greece and Spain, for example, when um, they got into hot water in terms of econ econ and in terms of the economy after the after the crash of 2008. Um, the Netherlands had a hand last year in terms of delaying payments, um, uh, emergency funds for the countries that were hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, and at the moment, in terms of within the kingdom itself, um, the national government is starving local city councils in terms of funds and also um, doing the same thing with the Caribbean islands in um, overseas. Local governments as in uh, it's, it's bigger than... Uh, uh, what, is it, what is the term in Dutch? The, the one that is the the gemeenteraad gemeenteraad okay yeah so the the local local um, councils the the uh, college from burgemeesters and wethouders so the eldermen and the mayors mm -hmm. they're all being given way too little money to actually properly function okay and because of decentralization because a lot of decisions have now supposedly been given to um the that college so that that council they are now the ones responsible of cutting and austerity measures and all these different things because they've simply been given way too little money mm -hmm. and so what you get is that last year july at the height of the pandemic um mayors and eldermen went to the binnenhof in the hague and protested it was the first time I'd ever heard something like that ever happening. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. And I think one of the things that you see as well is that that news of that resistance, that pushback is not being talked about enough. Because what's happening with the local city councils is the same thing that's been done on a national level in terms of poor people, in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, all of the sectors in which the participants or the recipients of government aid are seen as weak have been attacked and everything else has been boosted mm -hmm. and you keep seeing that pattern all over all over again and i think that comes because um the people who have gotten into the coalition the government coalition um, are doing exactly what they said during their campaigns mm -hmm. they're there for the strongest one in society and not for the ones that need government assistance mm -hmm. Okay, so so what you said about uh, smaller governments and defunding uh, defunding smaller community uh, you know local governmental bodies uh, 
could it then that means there's more like centralizing the power in like one elite uh, kind of um, uh, body of members and uh, kind of ignoring the smaller ones so therefore you are you can easily more easily do things from top down right exactly so what we've seen for the last now 11 years is that there has been a steady decrease of the amount of civil servants so right. a lot of the civil servants that before would help and would do administrative jobs and would make sure that the system runs smoothly for all of us have been cut and what do you get is that you get people who need assistance who need help now having to um, wait longer um, now having to um, deal with a whole bunch of bureaucratic hurdles that they need to jump through or jump over before they get help and you also see that with the automation of, of a lot of this help because of all these people you know being let go is that the automation itself has um, prejudicial ai and prejudicial algorithms so you see the usage of algorithms which are based on um assumptions which are white supremacist which are discriminatory which are racist and that's not being talked about because it's presented as this is neutral this is what we need to do these are the markers that we need to look at while all of it, all it's doing if you look at the outcome is it's separating some from the others right yeah when you say neutral and and tolerance and these terms, uh, you know, I've been in the Netherlands since 2011 um, and I kind of have, well, by, by the way, I'm Dutch now, <laughs> uh, so, so I'm kind of uh, a little bit more introduced to this, this, this um, uh, terminology of normal dune, tolerance mm -hmm. and uh, Ordinary, you know, so this kind of terminology that is always used in the so society that gives a very uh, cons uh, conservative kind of feeling to everything. Uh, from my point of view, uh, my when I uh, during these ten years that I lived here, uh, the Dutch general population when especially when you're talking about dealing with the offices of a government and when you're for example trying to re uh, make an, a reservation with the ind that's the immigration service or with anything related to any ministry uh, there's always people who are working behind so they're the front line is always um they are so much used to doing the normal thing, the normal procedure. And as soon as you ask them something that is a little bit uh, from the normal, everybody gets derailed. So I come from Iran, where it is a country that everybody has an opinion about everything, right? <laughs> and you, if you go to like a governmental office, you ask them something they don't know, they will figure it out. They will mm. make a call. They will like see on the internet so they, they will help you some way right mm. or they have an opinion about it but like here for example when i when i have a question that's just a tiny little bit out of the ordinary people have like this error message that comes oh sorry i don't know you know <laughs> and then you have to figure it out and find the channel for yourself yeah but like the the biggest hit for me uh, for for like facing this kind of uh, attitude was when I saw the poster from VV Day, Normal Dune, Gewoon mm. Normal Dune, just do it normally, and I was like, why? What do I need to do? Uh, that what am I doing that is not normal? And why do I need to do it normal? And how come this party has the majority? every time you know i think what happens is that um they've been able to solidify this positive outlook about the country and they've been able to solidify an image of being the winners 
And one of the things that I think we need to be aware of when looking at the Netherlands is that the Netherlands, um, in a lot of cultural ways, expresses the need to not be a victim, right? <laughs> So there's even there's even a word called um, uh, slachtoffer denken, slachtoffer spelen, playing the victim, thinking like a victim, um, where the violence is not necessarily acknowledged. Right? We want people to get over it and to move on. And I think there is where the crushing uh, mechanisms of the system keeps coming back, of our political system keeps coming back, because supposedly we have a system that everyone has a say that everyone can have a say but in actuality what happens is the ones with the biggest voices the biggest networks the ones with um the biggest outreach those are the ones that are seen as more important instead of the ones who are dealing with the actual violence that needs to stop and so um I think when when you look at this term of normal doen, right? You know, just do normal. It comes from a necessity not to rock the boat, because if you rock the boat and if you show that the system is not working, then actually what you're saying is that the people for whom the system is working are at fault, and nobody wants to be at fault of the system failing. And so what you see, um, even when the, the cabinet fell, the coalition fell in January, is that it took them so long to actually acknowledge that they did something wrong. And up to this day, they don't actually acknowledge that they did something wrong. They keep pushing it off to someone else. It's like, no, we didn't sign um, the order for people with a second nationality to be targeted. That was someone else who did that. No, we didn't do this. The AI did that. No, we didn't know about this even though there was a memo in 2017 that everyone saw and everyone talked about. And they're like, no, it wasn't shown to us, even though there are minutes of a meeting where the, where the notes were shown. So it's constantly the shifting of blame and the shifting of responsibility, because the responsibility then also shows that the system needs to change. And why would you change a system that is putting you in power and is giving you the space to stay in power? And that's that's the, the the crux of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. We want to have a raised finger to the whole world about human rights, about uh, progressive ideals. While in the Netherlands, um, we had to take a political party to the European Court for Human Rights because they would not allow women to be on their um, candidates list, right? So all of this thing of our country being progressive, our country thinking about what's best for everyone is all a smokescreen. And I think when, when talking about what you said earlier about like the role of the king, even the role of the king and the way in which the, the royals are used as marketing ploys. So the progressive ideals that we put to the outside world are marketing ploys because you don't wanna um, do business with a country that seems unstable. So all of this is about creating a semblance of stability, a semblance of progress, and a semblance of trying to be a guiding light for the rest of the world, while it's all really, really conservative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, if, just for the listeners, the, what you referred to in January, the cabinet fell, is, uh, is about uh, Mark, Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister's cabinet, they all resigned over a controversy about asking uh, vulnerable families to pay back uh, Tustach, which is about um, housing... Uh, child rental. benefits. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, child benefits. So government helps uh, uh, the people with children who have less income and then they asked for it back but the money was in some cases up to 40,000 euros per family right even more so what happened is that um families who had been receiving child benefits received an, a message that they could not appeal to um saying that they were um defrauding the state Mm -hmm. and they have to pay back everything they received and as a penalty also the amount that they received 
Mm. So they had to pay, um, from what I've understood, um, exorbitant amounts. And trying to pay that amount back then also led to them incurring other uh, debts, other fines. People lost their house. There was even a mother who committed suicide. Um, uh, apologies for, for saying that without a, a trigger warning. Um, there were people who up to this day have been scarred and still have not received anything back. And what you see is that the government, this government, um, had enacted policies in 2013, 2014, um, which led to this. Um, and also there were policies way before, from all the way 2002 to 2003, in terms of the uh, local city councils and the ways in which registration was being done of double nationalities. Mm -hmm. And in the, um, the tax office, that political debate which happened in 2013, 2014, led to the enactment of policies which caused, as they say, a chain reaction of, of events which led to this horrible, horrible situation. And then um, the government fell because they actively lied to parliament, mm -hmm. telling parliament that they did not know what was going on and how to deal with it. And then once that kept coming out, um, once uh, journalists from RTL, once journalists from Trau, mm -hmm. um, started sinking their teeth into it and finding all of these memos, which actually showed that no, what the government was saying and the cabinet was saying was not true. They couldn't, they couldn't go around it anymore. And then they, and then they um, stepped down. Mm -hmm. But what you see is that with the formation of a new cabinet, it's the same people who are yeah. being put in charge. So they they resigned in January and they were re-elected in 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 April. So they were re-elected like, in. Uh, oh, in... we take responsibility, and now <laughs> just two months before election. Exactly, and yeah. then so what happened is what you see is at the moment that they resigned in January, and then with the elections in March, they were able to take away that as a as a campaign theme, right? Mm -hmm. Because supposedly they took responsibility for what happened, and now you know, um, as we say in Dutch, zand erover en dan doorgaan. So you you. Uh, cover it with a bit of sand and you keep on going. And I think there is where <clears throat> a lot of the mistakes happen in terms of thinking about how to destabilize and how to reset um, these discriminatory practices and this policy. Because the other parties, including my own, um, were not able to put this back on the agenda in a meaningful and constructive and effective way to illustrate that these politicians should be barred from any public office. Yeah, but there's no regulations about that. There's no regulations about that. And the only way in which a minister can actually be held um, criminally liable or criminally accountable is if the whole second chamber, or I think like two thirds, vote to actually um, get the Bar public them. prosecutor involved. But, the public pro but that's never gonna happen because they have a majority in parliament. Right. So they're not going to put one of their own up on the chopping block. They're not, no. Okay, so so that is kind of like Dutch politics in general, if you want to talk. I, for me, the best example was don't rock, rock the boat. You see that in international re uh, reactions of the Dutch uh, politics about different disasters around the world or like, uh, well, there's a lot of examples uh, with in the 90s, uh, for example, with the UN soldiers from the, you know, they don't want to get involved in anything unless it's ex extremely necessary. And so like, for me, this, this makes sense. Don't rock the boat. But now speaking about second chamber and the first chamber uh, with re regarding the structure of the Dutch government, we have a second chamber and a first chamber of the parliament. And of course, there is also the judiciary system and there is the, uh, uh, yeah, the government. So parliament, uh, government, government and the judiciary system, like any well, modern country, there is, there is three branches. But there is also the king that uh, is more or less uh, kind of a, a role of a decor decorative figure, let's say, right? Uh, 
Um, no. Which, no. No, not necessarily. So in the Netherlands, the king has been stripped of most of his power. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a ceremonial function in certain regards. Ceremonial, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but when looking at the Dutch Caribbean, um, the king has retained his power to um, appoint uh, governors, to dismiss governors. The king literally still has power to influence local politics. So the royal, the royal house, the royal family, still has um, the power which it doesn't have in the Netherlands, it still has over the islands. And I think when looking at the kingdom structure, that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people seem to forget. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. So yeah, on papers, on paper, there's still powers as in like a supreme leader. Exactly. Um, so then there is, there is. Uh, can you explain? the first and second chamber that's the ears the camera and to the camera so the the first chamber is the senate um and the senate is seen as a part-time job which i think is always one of those fascinating things because i mean when you think about the senate um you think about the the political uh body the public body that actually signs the laws so they decide which laws actually become laws the second chamber is so the parliament is a full-time job, um, or it's seen as a full-time job, it's regarded as a full-time job, even though it's actually more. Because I think it needs to be said as well that um, the parliament members, so we have 150 in the country, and each one has um, one and a half um, a, a civil servant assistant next to them, right? So one of, their, one of the people that they get to work with that's paid for by the state. So that means that in essence, you have all these ministries that consists out of, I don't know how many, how many tens of thousands of full-time employees versus a group of 150 plus um, one and one and a half, right? So it's like 225 full-time employees versus about like 50,000 um, full-time employees, which is bizarre when you think about it. Our parliament is way too small to actually pay attention to every single thing that the government and the cabinet is actually doing. And what you see is that um, it's not just too small, um, it's also in a sense because of the way in which our coalition government works, um, a lot of the things that the smaller parties would want to put an agenda are either ignored or are pushed to the side because the coalition and the parties have already decided amongst themselves what the things are that they will vote on or vote for. And right now, during this period of the formation of the new cabinet, you can also see that, for instance, uh, parties that present, them, uh, present themselves as leftist or progressive are now voting along with the center right on certain issues because they want to be in the next cabinet. And these conversations are already influencing the ways in which they vote on current proposals. Um, so the first chamber is the Senate who vote on the laws that come from the second chamber, from the parliament. And in the parliament, you can, um, you can work on a proposal for a law and you have different committees that people are in that talk about different laws, different aspects. And then next to those committees, you also have the, um, the, the, um, the moment, like every Tuesday, there is a conversation between the cabinet and the parliament. And there is also where the leaders of the various parties in the second chamber get to ask questions based on the agenda of that day. And at the moment, I think it's good for the listeners to know, we have about 20 parties in Parliament, which is a ridiculous amount, but yet at the same time also shows the ways in which um, you hear 20 parties, but actually, actually, a lot of these parties are splinter parties from the center right or from extreme right, and they still vote on block. Um, and when you look at the last elections, you see that extreme right actually gained more foothold in the second chamber and that the left 
um, actually lost a lot of um, seats in the chamber. I'm glad that with that aim, we were able to get one seat in parliament. Um, I was number two. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit bittersweet. Um, but yet at the same time, I know that if I did get in, I wouldn't have had time to speak with you now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You say it's a full-time job, and then it's more than that. So. It's more than that, yeah. <laughs> you need two quizzes. Exactly. <laughs> One of the main reasons why Open Source Governance came into being was the disappointment with the representative system and how it's inefficient while uh, when you have a lobbying and when you have coalitions eating up all the little parties and like not giving anybody a voice and uh, corporations kind of um, um, influencing all sort of in all sort of way um, the legislation that comes out of the parliament um, for example, I know that in the Netherlands, Shell has a big say sometimes in, 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 in you know, deciding something uh, important within regulations. For, uh, I heard there was all these meetings between the prime minister back in a few years ago uh, that was not released the content. And so like this kind of stuff always happening in, in, uh, within the representative system and it's not really representing representing the constituencies in a in in a way that it was supposed to be you know it was designed to be um so this disappointment with the representative system and this distrust is kind of something that is is growing more and more as we go or, or uh, go in our way towards this uh, centralization of all wealth and um, yeah. Um, so, so when you are talking about smaller parties and bigger parties, like what question that I would have is how do you think these different parties are successful in representing people? And for example, the, the, the coalition, the biggest parties, the Vey Vey Day, and um, all the way down to yeah, Deze and Zestech and the bigger ones. How do you see the bigger parties and the coalitions actually representing it, like in a fair way? Like, if we want to be fair to all parties, what, how are they really representing their own, their constituencies? And therefore the whole population because practically they are the ones who are making the decisions when you have these little parties being overrun in the, in the voting. I mean, I think when talking about the bigger parties in the country, we shouldn't forget that the Freedom Party still is the third largest party in the country. So the party from Wilders um, gained a lot of votes. Um, the party from Baudet is also a big party now, you could say, uh, even though there have been people that split off. In essence, the ideology that people rally around is still growing and still big. And I think that's something that is um, really scary um, in terms of the constituencies and the ideologies and the thoughts that they represent and that they're pushing for and the policies that they want to enact. Because a lot of times what they're saying is they want to re return to a time in which um, I wasn't seen as human, right? Um, a lot of this talk about former glory is talking about the former colonial period. Um, and I even shouldn't say former colonial period, I should say current colonial period, because the ways in which the Netherlands is dealing and, and communicating and um, uh, cooperating or, or dictating to the islands how their policy should be is completely colonial. Um, and what you see in the growth of these parties and this ideology is that the constituencies that I am a part of um, are completely disregarded, are seen as um, not important for the political process. 
Um, and even within those larger parties, like the Labour Party or even now the Green Left Party, which is also um, up there in terms of uh, seats in Parliament and uh, different chapters all throughout the country, is that within their um, structures, um, you also see that there, there is a paternalistic way of thinking about minoritized populations, minoritized communities and constituencies. And you see that the ways in which policy, which thinks about um, the things that are dear to my heart and the things that I wanna deal with and talk with and what com my community and the communities that I'm a part of wanna talk about, is that presented for us instead of in um, conversation with us. And there is where all of the new parties actually come from because of this um, because of this moment of realizing that we can do this better. Um, we can speak for ourselves better. We can think about what we need better. We can present different ways of talking about policy changes that are needed in the Netherlands better. Um, also because it's not presented as an afterthought. A lot of times when you become part of those bigger, bigger parties, what you want to do is important for the moment of like the week and a half before the elections. And after that, it's like, no, we have other priorities now. And with the smaller parties, you are the priority. When you look at constituencies in these bigger parties, you need to realize that a lot of these parties themselves have come from coalitions. So a green left, is a party that actually is um, that came to be because several smaller parties came together. Um, the Christian Democrats, so the center right party, is also a party that came together because of different coalitions coming together. Um, and you see the ways in which that history is not being taken into account in the ways in which they think further um, and, and how they want to develop further. Um, and so when, when, um, I keep thinking of back about the creation and the moment of the founding of Bahrain. And it was at this pivotal moment when um, people were standing up and, and demanding that they not need to be parsed through a white lens to speak or parsed through a white voice to speak, that they could speak for themselves. Mm, yeah. So when you are talking about uh, even like left parties uh, uniting for a bigger coalition and then making a bigger party, it's always uh, the case with, uh, you know, um, because you can't do anything as a small party, you then compromise some of your um, disciplines and like basic values and mix with some other, uh, some other party or like find the like ones. And then and make a coalition, but then uh, th this always happens with representative system that you have to do that. You have to always compromise. But what I see in Bayern is like it proudly saying that's radical, and and we are here to to, to be uncomfortable, you know. <laughs> to, so like uh, we're we're gonna uh, we're gonna provoke you but it's okay and you have to deal with it is it something is am i correct like well i mean you are also in terms of thinking about this notion of compromise mm. a lot of times the compromises are made with other people's lives mm. right you will never hear a politician from one of these big center-right parties talking about something that they need to give up for the country to function it's always about, okay, you know what? Students need to get less money. Healthcare needs to get less money. Um, people from the Caribbean need to get less money. Poor people need to get less money. Um, but businesses get more tax breaks. Businesses get more lobbying uh, uh, capabilities. Um, rich people get more um understanding and a different tone uh, when they're spoken to um, immigrants um, refugees have to you know fit within a mold that we set we will send them only information in dutch and if they don't understand they need to figure out how to deal with it all this type of stuff 
is the creation of a hostile environment to compromises that have nothing to do with their own lives. Mm. And I think what we as a party, what Bain is is saying is that you will not compromise on our lives. Um, you will not decide for us what is best. We will talk with you and see what we need to be able to function optimally within mm. this country. Okay. So I want to go to uh, more to our buy-in and uh, its missions and vision. But before that, I have a question for you. Um, uh, who who would you say are the Dutch people now, who are like looking back at the history of the Netherlands? the contemporary history of it um, and the post-colonial era that we are now in, who would you say are the Dutch people that, you know, because the ways of organization of this country is, is still based on, it's not catching up with the, its population, let's say. So there, the population is, is changed or changing, uh, but the organization is still working as it was so like there is this unbalance between the function and uh, the population that it is functioning for yeah. and who would you say are the dutch people what are the minorities what are the majorities for uh, the listeners to have a better understanding about you know the the origin the origins of the population of the netherlands i think that's a really difficult question um also, because on the one hand, like, um, for example, I am, I am Dutch by passport, right? I'm, uh, I have become Dutch. I have been made Dutch because my ancestors were enslaved and carried to the Caribbean. Um, and I've grown up in the system which tells me that I have a Dutch passport and supposedly all the same rights as everybody else. Mm. And yet, when I look at all of the numbers and statistics that talk about um, Black Caribbean men, Black men, Caribbean men, Caribbean people, um, non-binary people who are Black, when, when you look at all of that scala, they're not being treated as if they're Dutch, right? So the notion of who is Dutch and who wants to claim it... Um, and we have and this who, term, an alechton, right? Exactly, yeah. Allochtonist. Yeah, but uh, and up until a couple of years ago, that was still used in policy. Then it was dropped, and now it's um, what's it called? New Nederlanders, I think. New Dutch people. Yeah. But even that doesn't really make any sense because I'm not new, right? Mm. Um, the Caribbean have been um, first in existence as. Uh, autonomous regions um, that were inhabited by local populations, then through pillaging and violence, they became um, they became property of companies that were ravaging the world in name of the Netherlands, in name of um, these groups of men who decided what would be necessary for the development of the Netherlands through pillaging of everywhere else. And then when those companies um, became bankrupt, then they became, they were sold to the state and now the state has them. And then um, after 1948 and the Declaration of the Human Rights of Man, um, they became uh, supposedly autonomous countries. But then a couple of weeks ago, I think a month, month and a half ago, there was a court case brought on by St. Martin to uh, the Netherlands in which the Netherlands stated that no, according to that 1948 document of you know, uh, decolonization, we are still de facto um, colonies of the Netherlands. We have never been changed in terms of what that means. And so my Dutchness and that I'm Dutch is, um, is something that was forced onto me, is not something that I asked for. Mm. And I think that puts me in a different type of category of who is Dutch. Also, when we think about like, what does it mean to be Dutch? Um, I think we need to have a really good interrogation of that understanding of the nation and the community um, because it is porous. It is people 
um, who were born and bred in the Netherlands. It is people who came here from elsewhere, like yourself, who were like, hey, the Dutch nationality um, is something that I want. It is different types of situations. Also, the people who then left um, and who are now being stripped of their nationality. I think we need to talk about like, what, what exactly does it mean um, to connect to that history? And for me, when thinking about who is Dutch, I would rather say um, everyone, I would rather not talk about citizenship mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a measure of Dutchness. And I would rather say um, the notion of, of Dutchness is connected to cultural practices, to ways of thinking. Um, is connected to how we change those and what we think of those when we change them. And it is, for me, also a question of how welcoming are we to constantly destabilize that category mm -hmm. of who is Dutch. I would rather not have a stable category of who is Dutch. Right. But of course, that's me. Um, I think other people will tell you that Dutchness is really clear to explain, but mm -hmm. I'm, no, that's not <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm sorry. It was a difficult question. Um, um, it's kind of uh, I completely understand what you mean when you say about uh, having a choice or or uh, of, of or being forced upon. Uh, for example, me, I am, I can never lose my Iranian passport by law. So I I I got naturalized and I got my Dutch passport as an addition to mm. my own you know but for example if you're turkish or if you're japanese you become dutch you have to give up the old one right um and then that's like a diff more difficult choice um you but, do i didn't i didn't know that i thought you you also couldn't lose it with turkish oh yeah i thought yeah okay. i thought it, i thought it was even so there was a case or there was a story i heard of a parent um, of Turkish descent, um, wanting his or, or her child not to have the Turkish uh, citizenship, but that the Dutch government, because of the bilateral agreements that we have with Turkey, refused that, that they had to have Turkish and Dutch. Oh, descent. okay. Then, uh, yeah, I'm mistaken. Um, yeah, but I so could, I could be mistaken too. I, I just well, thought I remembered that <laughs> from one time. Yeah. Well, I will confirm that for the listeners. Um, but yes, this. So, who is Dutch is is definitely a, a difficult question. But just for you know references of the population, um, the in the Netherlands there is. So there were the countries that the Netherlands had under colonial uh, power or control was uh, the Indonesia, the old the Indonesia region, and the Dutch Caribbeans, which are still so Indonesia is now independent, and the Dutch Caribbeans, some of the islands are uh, independent, and some of them are uh, more or less, as you heard uh, Quincy talking about it. And these are Aruba, Kurosawa, St. Martin, and the Caribbean Netherlands, which is Bonare, Saba, St. Uh, Estatius. I hope I did not massacre the names. I think it's good for the listeners to also know. So, yeah, also, Suriname was part of that. Yeah, Suriname. Um, West Papua was part of that. Uh, the Moluccan Islands, um, even parts of, of India for a while were colonized by the Dutch, South Africa, New York. Mm. Um, the Netherlands had Malaysia for 150 years. Yeah. There were parts at, at, um, in Iran itself where, where the Dutch were for a while in occupied space. So we've been all over the world in a certain sense. Mm. And here as well, I think it's it's interesting for the listeners to know that I'm talking about we, um, even though I'm a product, if you can call it that way, in a, in a really, um, in a weird way, I'm a product of that moving around. And so when you hear that we, it is about thinking through this notion of, of being Dutch 
or this notion of who is the Dutch could also be expanded beyond the national borders that we have at the moment. Because up until 1833, if I'm not mistaken, Belgium was also part of the Dutch kingdom, right? Mm. So even there, these ideas of um, secession, uh, these ideas of, of going away, thinking about the port of Antwerp and how important that was for the colonial period and how that's now being cut off even from the Belgian context and from the Dutch context while well, it's it's central to that story. Hmm. And and so when when you put all these pieces together and look at the outcome today in our demographics, you see that a lot of people after the independence of Indonesia um, came to the Netherlands. A lot of people after the independence of Suriname came to the Netherlands. Um, a lot of people from West Papua came to the Netherlands, from the Moluccans came to the Netherlands. In the 1980s, when the Shell refinery that was in Curaçao mm -hmm. left the island after being on the island for 70 years, um, pretty much plunging the island in, in economic uncertainty up till today, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people from Curaçao came to the, came to the Netherlands. So there is, there's this constant influx and this, this, um, this changing of the demographics. And I think now um, people who were not born here make up 10% of the population, if and, I'm not yeah. mistaken. And then you have the Turkish and the Moroccan, uh, which are also a big population, right? They migrated for... Uh, exactly, who came in the 1960s, yeah. 1970s, work, exactly, yeah. And then the Spanish and the, and the Italians that came to work in the mines, um, there's a lot of different type of migration that's happening. And also now at the moment, you have a lot of Eastern Europeans coming, a lot of Polish people coming. Um, and so this notion of, of first, second, third generation, even that troubles this idea of who is Dutch because in the national statistics, we only look at first and second generation. We don't look at third generation. Mm -hmm. So even to denote how much we've actually changed in terms of racial makeup, cultural makeup, ethnic makeup um, makes it makes it an interesting and difficult question and also makes it that we have to be um, specific in understanding that working along or still thinking through those old models of, of national loyalty, of citizenship loyalty um, doesn't work anymore. It's not it's not about that anymore. It's about what is the system and how is it treating us all? And yeah. are we all being treated equal or not? No. Yeah. So the romantic idea of nationalism and uh, European nostalgia and all of these things are kind of, uh, it's completely challenged and obsolete, I would say, um, when you have... Uh, when you have a country like the Netherlands that's been uh, colonizing all parts of the world and now in the post era, era of colonization, there is uh, all this migration coming in and the identity is kind of, uh, is, is different now. So, yeah, and I think, I think what we're seeing mm -hmm. is that these right wing, extreme right, radical right, uh, fascist uh, parties what they're trying to go back is to the simple understanding of us and them. Mm. And they're trying to turn back the clock and they're trying to undo, um, undo the ways in which the actions of the past have changed this country or while keeping it. the rewards. Well, I mean, it's on the one hand, it's about ignoring it. On the other hand, it's about hostile and really aggressive policy mm. to undo emancipation to undo women's emancipation, gay liberation, uh, uh, minority rights, um, decolonization. It's about trying to undo all of the gains that have been made and to return to a situation in which they have power and the rest of us need to ask and beg or need to be seen as subservient, need to be seen as if we're, um, as if our agency is connected to their their um to their idea of where we should be mm -hmm. and what our place in society is and it's like no um that's not gonna happen yes 
Right. So that was <laughs> that was a pickle. This one, uh, the question. Um, thank you. It was. I really enjoyed the. Uh, this question and then our conversation about this one. Um, so now I would, if, if you don't mind, I would like to focus on Bayein mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Um, um, a couple of questions is that first one is what does it mean Bayein and what is Article 1 and what are the objectives and visions of this party? How did it come to being? What is it doing now? Um, so I'll, I'll start off saying that I'm, I'm not speaking as an official spokesperson for the party. <laughs> I, think, I think that needs to be clear. Um, I was on the list and I am active. I'm an active member and I do a whole host of different things. Um, and and um, I think it's important for the listeners to know that the party uh, leader, uh, Silvana Simons, um, I usually speaks a lot about this stuff, but since it's part of this conversation, uh, I'll go ahead and answer. I think for me, when looking at the way in which the party started and what attracted me to become an active member and to uh, apply to be a candidate and to be on the list as, as the number two, is that it, it was unapologetic about where it came from. Right. Initially, the party was called Art Article One, mm -hmm. uh, in reference to the first article of our constitution, which talks about equal treatment. Right. There will be no unequal treatment to anybody based on anything. That's what the article says. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is great the, to have this explicitly be part of the mission, explicitly be part of the of the driving force. Um, and to not necessarily talk about identity, but to talk about the ways in which our identifications have been mobilized and have been instrumentalized as means to attack us, right? Mm. And I think that for me was important to think about. Like, this is not about us coming together and talking about um, who we are in a certain sense or, or what it is that we like. Yes, we do that too, but it's about talking about the things that we like and the ways in which we manifest ourselves in this world have been seen as ways to oppress us, right? Mm -hmm. um, that things that we have no control over, where we were born, um, our skin color, uh, that that is now being used as means to separate us and to treat us unequally within this society. And then when you think about the ways in which Article 1 um, fought that battle in the first election and gave a lot of people a certain type of hope and a certain type of understanding of what could be possible in politics, even though we didn't win a seat um, that first time around. Sorry, this is the last election, right? This is 2017. Yeah. So in 2017, we ran with three months of, of no, not even three months. Yeah, we, we ran in a period of three months. Um, I think on the 24th of December 2016, the party was launched and the elections were in March the next year. Mm. I mean, that goes to show how amazing and how inspiring that was. And even though it, we didn't win and even though um, um, people saw it as a long shot, it sparked something. And then the year afterwards, in 2018, uh, the party ran in Amsterdam in the city council, won a seat. And the way in which it has manifested itself in Amsterdam and pushed different conversations has led to a whole host of improvements from school kids not letting um, their home backgrounds be used in the evaluation of the test scores to making sure that every building which is built, every plan which is uh, uh, submitted for, for building in the city needs to have a green check. So it needs to be environmentally friendly. Um, to, to understanding the ways in which the um, freelance contracts and the zero hour contracts for municipal workers also had to be tackled and, and taken apart. And we need to think about how do we treat the people that take care of us, that make sure that every and all of these policies and these institutions keep running smooth. Because if they're stressed, then that stress is not going to be conducive for how we care for ourselves as a society. Mm. And so when I looked at that, I was like, this is amazing. And even the setup that they have in the ways in which 
the people who are working in the office in Amsterdam who are working in the coal in the in the in the core group there it makes you understand that politics can be different and that difference can be um, about fighting the good fight can be about fighting an intersectional a decolonial and a radical fight and with radical we mean tackling it from the root so not necessarily only looking at the symptoms but looking at the causes like what is causing this unequal treatment if it's policy x y or z let's go after policy x y and z and not just um, um, throw money at it and see it as something that needs to be dealt with by by finding money that already we're not getting from the national government, right? Mm -hmm. And so when um, the party had to change its name to Bayain, that, that, that understanding of Bayain, of together... Um, uh, sorry, what was the name before? Article 1. Article, okay. Yeah. And then when, when it became Bayain, then it was even more about understanding that this is a collective fight. Mm. This is not a fight of different groups... Um, uh, uh, based on their own identities. This is a fight based on solidarity. This is a fight based on the understanding that all of our oppressions are connected mm -hmm. and all of the ways in which the system tries to separate us, tries to divide us, is ways for us not to connect and not to think about what are the overlapping structures that we can tackle to, to make this a more equal, equal kingdom for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so the driving force, if I can say it as a, as a, as an active member, the driving force for me to be part of this and what I recognize in the people that I also see doing different activities for the party on the local level, um, working in different type of uh, working groups, is that we all want to make sure that we don't lose each other. And mm. I think that's important, um, that no one falls by the wayside. Um, we, You know, the the... There's that saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that's what Bayain is about. Once policies, once um, uh, violent ideas, ideologies within politics are dismantled, then it becomes better for all of us. And that's where that's what Bayain is about. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Uh, I think it's also when the tide rises, it lifts up all the boats. Is this a Dutch saying also? No, it's a. I think it's a. It's an English saying. Oh, okay. Uh, or an American saying, but I, I just love that. I love this idea of um, thinking through how hmm. a collective fight is what we need, and hmm. we need to be able to connect all of these different um, understandings of where we're going wrong. Hmm. Okay. That then it, it it then again brings in the idea of organization and and the ways of doing things um so when you think about when you're uh think about by and uh, uh, talking about minorities and the communities and local in a local scale uh and also imagining the all this defunding for uh, the uh, smaller parts of the government that people have actual access to uh who may, by the way, may or may not know that they have these tools. For example, I'm working with another project that is about, uh, uh, you know, um, smart urban safety technologies. And there's often the case that people don't know they have these tools in, in uh, to organize themselves. They don't know they have uh, 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 committee. They don't have a commi yeah. co local commission for, uh, commission for like the city or like how to talk to the city or do the do the young people even bother doing that for example to talk or is it just uh, retired people who are, are using these tools so when you were talking about like communities and and uh, the mi uh, minority groups being eaten away with these like giant groups uh, parties um, and thinking about the idea of every uh, member having equal right to to actually affect uh, legislation what would you like if you could like fantasize about having an open source legislation that all members could uh, without the need for representation uh, participate in in in, in uh, affecting uh, the legislation of 
a community, let's say, just like a local community, or we could also talk about the whole country. How would you see that? Uh, like, do you think people would then use or engage with this kind of, uh, let's say, duty of as a citizen, or like, or would they? Would it? Would it something be something that, for example, by aim would preach, uh, or like would, uh, you know? Uh... I, I think for me. Um... It's also about creating a culture that invites that. Hmm. So at the moment, what we have is a culture that makes all of these different public bodies um, that give you a say hmm. really difficult to find, right? Hmm. So they're there, but they're not accessible in various ways, yeah. um, either, in, either in language or literally physical space hmm. or literally the language uh, that they use. So not just that it's only Dutch, but also is it um, is it really difficult words that are being used? Is it accessible words? Is it a lot of the things that we forget in this country is that most people don't necessarily go to tertiary education, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when thinking about tertiary education, a lot of the reading and writing level um, that is used for public proclamations or information from the government is usually in a high standard that excludes people. Mm -hmm. So even when thinking about like what's the language that we use, even there um, we end up pushing people out who might even know the language. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that needs to happen to give people more understanding of where they could have a say and where they could vote and where they could do more things in terms of um, governance, local governance, community governance, is by making sure that people understand and um, that the people that organize these things understand that it needs to be accessible. Mm -hmm. And once it becomes accessible, then you can create a culture where everyone feels safe to walk in and participate. And will. As long, and will but I think, I think people are willing. Mm -hmm. It's a question of how do you make sure that it also connects to their daily lives. Yeah. If you organize these meetings at one to two, the people who have jobs won't be able to come there, right? And that's usually what happens with the Khabib committee. They organize these things, these moments when you can have inspiration, where you can talk and you can, you can add your two cents to it. They organize these moments according to an agenda of a voting block and a constituency which is not accessible, which is not everyone. Mm -hmm. The person who has two jobs uh, but wants to have a say in the public park or wants to have a say of some uh, of the of the um, I don't know, wants to have a say of the ways in which the garbage is being picked up in the neighborhood, mm. won't be able to go there if it's at four o'clock in the afternoon, mm. right? And if you want to tell someone, but then you need to make the time, then you're telling someone that they should not be able to um, go to work that they need to take time and work off, how is that compensated if yeah. they're already working two jobs? So, so we can get people involved mm. once we make it all more accessible, once we understand what it is that the people that we're trying to reach um, need in terms of structure to be able to participate. Right. So you could say that uh, the, the tools are there, but they're not really efficient and inviting and necessarily aiming <laughs> to to voice people's opinions so it is democratic democratic between uh but but it, it is not in practice because uh, all right an example that i have is the 2016 uh, referendum in rotterdam for public housing hmm. you you talk about the language of uh that that it's used for 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 people to engage with these uh, questions the referendum was uh, about public housing and social housing that uh, the city wanted to expand uh, kind of the core of the city center and like, expel some sort of uh, 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 houses that were social housing to an outer ring Mm. And they had that kind of into uh, in a referendum, but the question was so loaded with 
uh, heavy wording and also very unclear and not uh, communicated well enough. So people did not participate in that uh, uh, referendum, right? Exactly. And then, so the city had to make the decisions because there was not enough votes, so they did not consider it official. And uh, so they just went ahead and then, and, 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 uh, yeah, extended the, the central ring of the central. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so with, with the language, it, I think it does make a difference. Um, right. Um, I <laughs> We are now into an hour and, and 17 minutes. I don't want to uh, keep this, keep you much longer. Um, but I wanted to like give you a chance if you want to talk about your practice, uh, if you want to talk about uh, Zuarte Piti's racism project that you initiated uh, many years ago, uh, or, or anything else you want to say about uh, uh, today or <laughs> what we talked about. I mean, mm in terms of thinking about politics and thinking about governance and thinking about the ways in which we can make it more accessible um i think projects like yours are necessary because it shows the lack of information that's been given right and it tries to fix it and so for me um when looking at my own practice it's also about um, information and it's about research and it's about different ways of presenting research and talking about um, the ways in which we can learn from the past to make the future better. And I think when when um, looking at politics and when looking at um, the system that we have, the system is all about thinking about the future. A lot of the planning that happens in politics is about future. Mm. And so if we understand that future planning is part and parcel of politics, then we need to make sure that the future is accessible for all of us. And at the moment, the future isn't. Where a lot of the, even, even when thinking in a simple way of um, the mock-ups that are made, right? When you see like these digital versions of the future, you can count the amount of people of color or black people maybe on one hand when they show hundreds and hundreds of people. And I think that for me is one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved in politics as well is because I want to see not just myself, I want to see my community, I want to see communities of my friends in the future. Mm. And I want this, this country to think about itself in the future um, beyond the frames of the past, right? Mm. And I think that's the thing that we're seeing now is that the frames of the future keep being constituted with the ideas of a past that is long gone um, and a future in which we're still fighting over what that past meant. The fact alone that the Dutch government is refusing at this point to apologize for slavery says something, says something about the future that we want to enact and the ways in which our relationships and our relations within that future um, are still bound by these ideas of what the past was and how to interpret it. And I think when, when people listen to the podcast, I hope that they come away with the idea of, um, of their own agency, of their own positionality, of their own um, understanding of what they can do. And, and I hope as well that they're able to find communities and collective in which they can organize themselves to see themselves and place themselves in that future. Um, and that's why I, wa I wanna thank you as well, Pendar, because this, this has been great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on that beautiful note, I think it was really, really beautiful what you said in the end, uh, thinking about future. I wanna thank you too for being part of this. It's an honor and uh, Quincy Garo, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I hope I see you soon. See you soon, definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely. And happy birthday. Happy oh, birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, there was there was a storm. It was supposed to be a storm weather, 
uh, but it wasn't. So I canceled the birthday. I just oh, invited okay. like a few of my friends to my house, but it yeah. didn't storm. Uh, so I was like, okay, classic Dutch weather. <laughs> <laughs> You had me part cancel my party, and now there's not a single of drop. Oh. <laughs> but it's okay. I'm used to that. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and my conversation with Quincy. Hopefully you have developed some sort of idea about how the politics in the Netherlands work, its structure and a little bit about how things are running in here. I want to thank Sebika Rotterdam for supporting this episode and helping us to carry on with this podcast. I will try to invite more interesting people such as Quincy and create a conversation that is valuable for you and for myself and to also help develop the project further in allowing us to empower ourselves in making collective decisions together and have a better coexistence. If you want to listen to more episodes, you are more than welcome to visit our website, opensourcegovernance.com, or visit us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and now YouTube with subtitles, always with the handle Project OSG. And if you feel like supporting us, you can always use the donate button in our website. Don't forget to subscribe for more episodes, and until next time, have a good one.